see movie, right? It's showtime. <laughs> and things have changed. Yes. Well, welcome back, everybody. Jeff Frick here in the home office. I'm really excited to have someone that I met uh, a few years back at the at the Women in Data Science Conference uh, with really a really interesting art form that I'd never seen kind of before in practice. And turns out she's been doing this for decades and decades and decades. She's published in all kinds of of, uh, of, of publications. She spoke to the UN and we're really happy to have her coming from her home studio uh, in New York. Liza Donnelly. Liza, uh, great to see you. Great to see you, Jeff. How are you doing? Terrific. So Great. you you are a, a phenomenal artist. So we first met at at the at the Wids conference, and you were doing this thing I'd never seen before, which was which was live drawing the conference speakers. And I was so um, kind of touched at the way that you were able to capture them and their their kind of the spirit of their talk and what they were trying to say. In, in what I would describe as a relatively simple style of, of, of cartooning. And I'm just curious to jump in, we'll just talk about WIDS. When you're looking at somebody on stage and trying to grasp, you know, kind of that energy and have it come through your hand and back into the, onto the page, what are you, what are you looking at? What, it, what is, what is, what are you taking in? Well, it's um, all of it, uh, but to, um, to, to to try to analyze it, I the person walks on stage. I, I I notice what their features. I notice what they're wearing, and also their body posture. And um, I try to capture that quickly. What I'm what I'm also doing simultaneously is listening to what they're saying. So, uh, particularly for this conference you're referring to, I would try to listen to and pull out key sentences or key words. Sometimes in that particular conference about data science, I had no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> but you can always you could always uh, pull out something that's relatable to everybody. Um, right, right. Well, let's, let's back up a step because because uh, your your journey started. I think you said in one of your TED talks at seven when your mom gave you uh, yeah. some some drawing materials and mm -hmm. and and some paper, and, and you learned to draw. And you've been you've been a professional animator, cartoonist, artist, illustrator, graphic. I don't know which of the of those you prefer. <laughs> You're kind of all of the above. Um, yeah. We talked a little bit before at the WIDS off camera about kind of the role of uh, cartoons and the role of, of uh, graphics and illustrations in the modern world and in communicating really uh, hard ideas and complex ideas and difficult ideas. Mm -hmm. You've got a super special talent. You've been doing it for the New Yorker for, for decades. When you think back on the role of uh, of artists, and, and obviously there was a stuff that, that happened in France. Um, when you started out, is that kind of where you thought this would go, or how did how did it how did it kind of evolve into something that was kind of more fun and an expression mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. something that's much more powerful, much more meaningful, much more important uh, to a broader audience? Oh well, um, well you know it began as you said decades ago when it was all just about print, and uh, I wanted to be in the New Yorker. I grew up during the civil rights era, the Watergate time and uh, assassinations and everything. And so as a young child, I was in Washington DC, as a young child, I really wanted to, I wanted to be a political cartoonist. So that was already in my my system, I think, that I that's what I wanted to do. It's just a matter of finding how to how to merge the availability of, of outlets then with my sensibility, which I'm a quiet person. So, um, and I'm, um, at the time, I should put, put this way. At the time, I I thought, um, well, I, I don't think I can be a political cartoonist because I don't have strong enough opinions. I because what I saw at the time, people I really admired, like Herb Block and uh, the Washington Post and Gary Trudeau um, doing Doonesbury, but they're they're really hard hitting um, cartoons, and I didn't I didn't know how to do that. I, uh, I was such a shy, quiet person. Um, but the New Yorker has always had political cartoons, and so I saw the New Yorker as a, as a teenager, and I thought, well, maybe that maybe I could be be there. And uh, luckily, they bought my work right after college. So, and my first political cartoon with them was published in 1984. So the political side of it was always there, and always trying to do the New Yorker political cartoons are more they're less about my opinion about something as a cartoonist, and and more about my observations of the culture or the political situation. Like um, I did something about Tiger Woods. I've drawn about um, uh, 
uh, Walter Mondale, uh, things that, and, and gender diversity, things like that. So, but that was just print. So not just, but at the time it was print and there were no other outlets except for other publications. Did, did you intend on this, did you intend on the path when you started, you know, drawing, um, did, did, did you see this as an av avenue to express uh, concerns about really deep topics versus, um, you know, or did that just kind of yeah. evolve over time? I did. did. No, I did. Because I, because like I said, when I started out, the world seemed to be falling apart uh, in the in the 70s. So um, I wanted to help and I felt that was how I could help was by drawing political cartoons. And um, it's evolved, of course, over time that um, more, I'm more political. After 9-11, I was just perking along at the New Yorker for a couple of decades and doing illustration for other people. And um, I really didn't have an outlet for a lot of political stuff. But after 9-11 after and also the internet had sort of taken off by that time, um, I began to do more and more political cartoons. I, I vowed to, uh, to, um, to, to be more political and particularly to focus more on women's rights, which is something that I'm passionate about. Right. And you could, if the New Yorker didn't want it, then I could put it online. There were several new emerging uh, uh, webzines, they called them, and uh, I could put, put them online. Like this one I think you're showing right now is was a drawing I did. Uh, can't remember exactly who that was for, not the New Yorker, but it's something that I would put online um, and uh, get reaction to it, get people to see it. Uh, it you know, if the New Yorker didn't want it or if no, another publication didn't want it, then I certainly could use it somewhere. Right. So you had an interesting comment in one of your TED Talks, and you've done a ton of TED Talks. I, I think I saw watched four of them this morning. Uh, but one of them you talked about. I'm so sorry. No, no, I love it. But, <laughs> but you talked about when you were young, you drew for your mom, right? When you first got started. Mm -hmm. And then you said, then you drew to try to understand, as you said, growing up in, in turbulent times in DC mm -hmm. in the 60s and 70s. But then you talked about this thing in your 40s with, when 9 11 happened. And it sounded like it was a real epiphany in terms of, you know, now I'm just drawing for me. Like it almost sounded like that was a, a step function in terms mm -hmm. of just, you know, I am going to to draw in, in, in kind of a, a different way of thinking about, you know, how you would draw and what you would draw. And it sounded like a real epiphany moment. It was, it really was. Cause I think like a lot of people, 9-11 sort of shocked us into all re-examining our lives and our, our purpose for being here. And uh, I think I'd lost that for a bit while I was, you know, I had it when I was younger and then in the eighties and nineties sort of lost it. Just enjoying drawing cartoons. I, of course I raised my a sort of family, so. right, but right. Um, it takes time. But 9-11, um, I, I was going to stop cartooning. I thought, well, I don't see the point of what I'm doing. I really was shocked. And, and I, maybe I'd go into teaching or something. But then I drew that particular cartoon. Did I send that to you? Um, and it's, uh, uh, it's about 9-11, the aftermath of 9-11. And the uh, when, when, uh, when can I stop being scared, I think? Or no, that, that's the yeah, when, Daddy, when can I stop being worried now? A little girl's yeah. asking her father. Yeah. So... Um, Yes. That the New Yorker bought it and ran it a couple of months, like a month or two after 9 11. And I thought, okay, I'm, I'm back on track. But I decided then and there to do more political cartoons. And I felt um, that's my purpose. And also the feminist cartoons started to be more a part of my, my life. You got, so, you got so much stuff. I mean, I. I... I don't, I don't even know if I want to ask how many cartoons you have in your, uh, I have no idea in your portfolio. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> there was a time, Jeff, when I could, when I could, uh, somebody say, Oh, do you have a cartoon on this subject? And I go, uh, yeah, I have one, but now I'm like, uh, I don't know, maybe Right. <laughs> I just don't. Yeah. It's just a lot of content and, and I'm not alone. So many of us cartoonists are, we, we produce New Yorker cartoonists. Anyway, we produce eight, eight to 10 cartoons a week, uh, most of them don't see the light of day, so. But now they can though, right? Hopefully now you've got different publishing uh, opportunities. Sure. Mm -hmm. So shifting gears a little bit, you know, uh, in terms of you being kind of, you know, you're, you're quiet. And again, I think, I think your art is quiet. It's impactful, but it's, it's in a very kind of a soft voice. This has really opened up opportunities. You've now spoke at the United Nations. Um, you, as we've mentioned, you've done a ton of TED Talks. I saw your uh, getting your doctoral degree, putting your robe on for the first time at the University of Connecticut, uh, and yeah. working in some basketball. But I'm I'm curious, you know, kind of your perception of how how this uh, career path uh, has opened up these opportunities that are far different 
um, then, then the, the, that young woman, you know, walking into the office, dropping off some cartoons and hoping something yeah. gets picked for next week. And if you can reflect on, you know, being, being involved in, in meeting with uh, Kofi Annan and, and, and the UN mm-hmm. and, and, you know, taking on these really big um, kind of challenges. Yeah, I feel incredibly fortunate. Um, well, just sort of, as you're talking, it made me think where did this all come from? Where did it start? And I think I can, um, first of all, being quiet, I don't know why people are quiet. I don't know why people are shy. I don't really know why I was shy and quiet, but I think it was uh, partly trying to figure out how to fit in. Um, and my art has helped me fit in. My art drawing has helped me figure out a place for myself, um, which I didn't really understand when I was young, but, um, and also my art spoke for me. I didn't have to use my mouth. I did, could speak with my drawings. But um, in the late 1990s, I started to think more seriously about why there weren't more women cartoonists um, practicing, because there just weren't. Uh, and I started, and I was on a panel um, uh, for, uh, at the Editorial Cartoonists Association about women cartoonists. I was one of maybe four or five women on the panel and um, there was a sea of people in the audience and they were all men, they were all male cartoonists. And it just was a visual like shock, like, whoa, there really aren't many of us and what is this all about? So I started investigating, particularly the New Yorker, why that was true at the New Yorker. And I, um, I ended up writing a book about it, Funny Ladies, and came out 15 years ago. And just before I forget to tell you, I have a new edition coming out this fall. So I'm really excited about that. But anyway, Funny Ladies, it was about the women cartoons of the New Yorker and they began, actually the New Yorker was always pretty welcoming to women. So there were women there in 1925 when the magazine was founded. But when I, I, when I wrote that book, I decided to create myself a little um, uh, speaking tour because the publisher was small, they wouldn't do it for me. So I created it. And I, I went around to various places in the country and talked about these women. And that, because I was talking about something I was passionate about, feminism and cartoons um, and women artists, uh, I, it was easy to talk about the subject and it was easy to share this like I want to share this with you this is something that interests me so that's where my speaking uh, uh, abilities began was was talking about my passion for some other people um, amazing women and from there that just morphed into I got a I convinced Pat Mitchell to hire me to do a TED talk uh, the first women the first uh, TED woman which was in Washington DC 10 years ago and um, I'll always be grateful to Pat. And that was a frightening experience, but uh, it was really rewarding to hear people laugh because I always show my cartoons behind me. I'm not talking about the cartoon, I'm talking about some other subject and the cartoon is like a, an exclamation point to whatever I'm saying or, or a, lightning, uh, a lightning rod or a, a lights, lightness, it, light, ends lightness to, it lends lightness to whatever I'm talking about. Um, and then from there, I, I was asked to do more speaking for more TEDs, TEDx's. Um, and I just think people like, people love cartoons for one thing, and they're fascinated with those of us who do them. So the combination of um, seeing the cartoons and seeing me who creates them, and then also cartoons can uh, really um, soften the subject, not soften the subject, but soften the person so that they enter the subject, um, a difficult subject like you know, 15 years ago, feminism was not as not as much of a um, accepted concept as it is now. Right. So right. it was a way to talk about stuff. And I, I've done a lot of hard hitting cartoons now about um, harassment and um, abuse and rape and stuff like that, which is not funny, but it's a way to bring people into a subject. And then the UN was connected with um, that. That was just such a thrill to meet Kofi Annan. That was in connection with a wonderful group called Cartooning for Peace. And um, that was started right after the um, Danish cartoon controversy, if you recall, that was yes. uh, in 2005. And actually, uh, that was before my TED talk, but um, so I got a little speaking in there, but not a whole lot. I just got to meet Kofi Annan. And the it, Cartooning for Peace is a uh, international organization started by Kofi Annan and Jean Plantu to help bring cartoons um, to different people around the world and and to and to have them be. Um, uh, facilitators for co- for conversation and discussion about global issues. So it's a great, it's about 160 people, cartoonists in the organization. I've met cartoonists from all over the globe. It's just wonderful. Um, 
we sometimes get together in different parts of the world and, and uh, get to talk about cartoons. And um, so that's, and, and unfortunately, Kofi Annan just died, but he, if you look him up online, you see his, I think if you go to Cartooning for Peace, you can see his, his speech, it's probably on my website too, his speech about cartoons and he realized how important cartoons were for our, for our world. So right. always, always grateful to him. You've got a ton of books on Amazon. I, I guess I hadn't I hadn't really ever thought of you as in terms of putting all these things together in, in a in a book. But when I pulled up your uh, your author page on Amazon, is you had all kinds of great books in here. Uh, so, a lot of them, yeah. Um, well, uh, yeah. After Funny Ladies, well, I did, some, did I did a bunch before Funny Ladies, like collections and a bunch of dinosaur books for kids. Right. Um, uh, since then, I. Um, I did a couple more that were about women and and cartooning and women and and uh, feminist writing. So, yeah, love it, love it. One of the Thank things you. you talked about, and you you kind of mentioned it briefly here in one of your talks, is creativity is about connection. It's funny that you define creativity around the actual um, subject of connection, and you and you talk a lot about really the importance of listening. Um, mm -hmm. and, and not only listening to the topic, like when we opened up this, this conversation, but just listening and understanding and really being observant. I, I find it um, really refreshing, right? Because I think so many people in this crazy world that we live in that's going so, so fast, you know, don't necessarily take a minute just to sit back, open their eyes and pay attention and see the world around them. And those are, you know, some of your probably less powerful um less powerful cartoons, but still really intimate ones are, you know, just like a person in the subway station or a person mm -hmm. out on the streets, you know, obviously not doing as much of that in New York anymore as, yeah. as I know you wish you would, but, you yeah. know, just this, this, um, this kind of appreciation of the communication of the moment of just the, the, the beauty of, of, of small moments, I think uh, is a whole nother class of, of, of ones that you kick out that I think okay. are just as beautiful and just as, uh, as touching. So really, it's really good stuff. I, I love life and I, it's all about appreciating what's around you. Um, you're making me think about a re recent documentary. I, I was, I watched some of it about uh, Andrew Wyatt and, um, and there, and that's, that's the time I sort of grew up into the art world, uh, watching the art world and Jackson Pollock was still around doing his thing. So the contrast between Jackson Pollock and Andrew Wyatt and, and then Norman Rockwell too, there's, there's an interesting, uh, differences in how they approach art like Jackson Pollock was all internal like expressing oneself whereas Wyeth was was a uh, was more and Rockwell were more um observers more looking at the world around them and uh I know that Wyeth both Wyeth and at the time Wyeth and Rockwell were were not uh, appreciated by the critics so much um because that's uh that's a whole nother story um but I think Wyatt, I, in this documentary, Wyatt talks about how he would spend weeks on end with his subjects. You know, he'd go and live with them. He'd spend time with these people. So he not only could see them and draw them, he didn't, he didn't take photographs, he'd draw them, but he knew who they were. He got to know these people. He got to feel who they were. And it, and it certainly is reflected in his portraits that he did. Right. You know? Well, that's funny. You segued that just perfectly. I had it teed up and everything uh, oh, <laughs> with, with with this guy. So what a what a great um, a great honor yeah. that you had earlier. I guess last year. Now we've turned the calendar. Yeah. To to have your your one woman show at the Norman Rockwell Museum, and I was fortunate that they had a nice live stream as you kind of walked around. Actually, it was the the genesis of this conversation and talked about you know a bunch of the the pieces that they had on display. Norman Rockwell. I mean, it doesn't get much more iconic and and kind of a across across everyone at least here in the United States as to his his um his art I wonder if you can you know kind of share what that meant to you what was it like to actually be there and 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 and, to, and you you uh you spent time working there too as well if I believe correct yeah oh my god what a thrill what a um a shock to get that email from Stephanie Plunkett who's the curator um to invite me to have a show there this summer this last summer uh it went into the fall it's funny because a lot of a lot of kids watching this, right? They don't know Saturday Evening Post. They they, they don't understand of a, a time when even like the Brady Bunch, just to pick some more poppy, when when everybody watched the same thing or consumed the right. same thing. It's so right. different than today's hyper personalization. I don't even know, you know, if they can kind of 
Gronk, what, yeah. what that well, meant. Rockwell was, um, and of course I was aware of him when I was growing up, but my, my family were New Yorker readers and there was probably a distinct difference between New Yorker readers and Saturday Night Post readers, which were more middle America, right? And he, he had a cover, although he was a New Yorker, but he, he wanted to be a great illustrator and he ended up being one, but he, wanted, he ended up doing covers for the Saturday Night Post every month, I guess, um, almost every month. And that's why he became so famous, not aside the fact, not, not to belittle the fact that he was an, an incredible illustrator, uh, an artist. But um, so yeah, he was extremely well known and he went to the White House and um, he was a humble man, uh, funny. Um, and I was aware of him growing up. And so when Stephanie wrote me and said, would you like to have a one woman show? I was blown away and of course I'm gonna do this. And um, I spent the next couple of months going through my archives to figure out what, what to give her. And I did a lot of back and forth with, with her on that, um, what, what the point of the exhibit was. It, was. it was a one woman show, but it was also, she wanted to express, uh, it was called comic relief. So she wanted to, to get at the heart of what I, what I try to do, which is talk about serious subjects, but yet make people feel better, feel good, feel optimistic or, or think about something seriously. Um, so uh, yeah, and it opened in July and we had an online virtual opening, which you can see online, I think. And they're actually making the exhibit now, it's closed, but they're making it into a, an online uh, uh, exhibit so you can see. And you can go there now and see a lot of it, what was in the show then. Yeah. But um, it was a great yeah. honor. And yeah. so during that time period, I read, I read his autobiography. I'm now reading the biography that was written about him. But I read a lot about him and I watched a lot of videos. There's some videos online about Rockwell. And I began to see a connection between the two of us, even though our work is really almost polar opposite in, in look. But um, he, he really wanted to, uh, he was an observer of life, of American life. And people have criticized him for just observing a certain class of people, um, a certain demographic. And that's, and he did, because it was for the Saturday Evening Post, he had his restrictions by working for them. Um, they didn't want to have black people on the cover in any kind of prominent way. Um, if they were on the cover, they were in subservient roles. He wasn't allowed to, to pick people smoking, but um, some other things too, but uh, but he, he it was his living and it was his work and he did the best and he made, I think in, when he was with the Post, he did make, he, he did sneak in some, some commentary in there a little bit. And if you look at closely at the work, um, but it wasn't until he left the Saturday Evening Post that he began to um, to do paintings that were much harder hitting and for himself really, although they were for, for the Light for Look magazine at the time. And they were of the civil rights uh, um, uh, era and, and the, like the killing of uh, the, uh, the Mississippi murders down in uh, Schwerner and, and uh, those guys who were, were murdered down in Mississippi, he did a painting about that. So he began to be much more expressive and, and use his use his skills to talk about important social issues um, with, with his painting. Yeah. So, and with me, um, I think there's something similar there in that I spent a lot of my decades just drawing cartoons for the New Yorker, which I really enjoyed, but then it wasn't until 9-11 hit that I really began to do some soul searching and thinking that I got to do something more with what I have available, my skill. Right. Um, and um, so you, you learn to work with, within the confines of your employer or the, the magazine that um, that you work for. And for him, he, you know, the post was the pinnacle for him, for his illustration. The New Yorker is the pinnacle for me and I'm still working there. But um, you, there, are, there are gatekeepers there and there's people that, that have their, their um, opinions and they, right. they right. you have to work in, within the controls. So right. um, it's a trade-off. So that's, a, that's a, again, another great segue um, of something I want to get into in, in how that's changed and, you know, kind of generally uh, distribution, right, was in control. Why does William Randolph first build a beautiful house down in San Simeon, right? It's because the newspapers had control. Distribution had control back in the old day. But you work in a digital art form. Now uh, you've got, there's tons and tons of, of channels of distribution. I've got, I've got this little laptop pulled up and I've got all the, all the lies of stuff I got. You've got your beautiful WordPress site. Uh, you've got you. Twitter, you've got Medium, you've got 
uh, Instagram, you got this new thing, Haps. I've never heard of Haps. I don't even know what Haps is. I um, <laughs> need to find out what Haps is all about. You got these uh -huh. beautiful profiles on the New Yorker. You're an accomplished author in Amazon. Um, so there's so many channels now. So, was, you know, like most things in life, right? The, the same side of the coin can be good or bad. Um, what, you know, how are you kind of adapting to the new kind of digital distribution world? What's, what's kind of your approach? Is it super exciting? Is mm -hmm. it super confusing? Is it, is it overwhelming? How, how are you, you're, you're clearly embracing a lot of these kind of new tools and new opportunities. How has that kind of changed uh, your relationship with your primary employer or the way you think about your art or, or, mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of your relationship with, with people that you would have never, ever met because you just dropped off the art and yeah. they read it in the paper. Well, that's, that's, that's a big question. Um, I think it started to, I'm, I'm, I love technology. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not educated in it, but I like to adopt anything that new, any new, pretty much any new technology that comes around along. But um, I began doing live drawing, like you described at the top of this interview, um, on my iPad. I began doing that. Um, so I should get a date and have a date ready, but it, now it must be five years ago, by drawing what I saw on the television set. Like the first thing I drew, I think, was the State of the Union address that year, which I always watch because I think it's kind of fascinating. It can be very boring, but it's also fascinating. And I was drawing it, and, and there was a, you know, Twitter was relatively new. Well, not, no, it wasn't. Anyway, I, I was on Twitter, but my, the app I was using was new and you could, you could draw something and then send it out immediately on Twitter. And I started doing that. I was drawing just the people speaking, Obama, I think it was. And um, uh, I, I saw the reaction. I saw people loving it because my drawings can be bold and bright and, 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 not without, and, with, and often without words. So at the time it was quite different for Twitter to see a flash of color going by like that, that wasn't a photograph. And so people started following me because of that. And I started doing the Oscars, the Grammys, you know, anything that I sensed was a, was a national or global event, I would live draw it and put it out on, on social media, also now Instagram. And um, I began to notice that that was something that um, I could do. And now people hire me to do it. So that's nice. Right, right. <laughs> and I get to go to the Oscars. We can talk right. about that, I guess. But the whole point of me saying that was, um, I began to say, well, you know, maybe I don't need the big media. I mean, it's I do have the New Yorker name attached to my work and that people associate me with that that wonderful magazine. So I, I have that and I'm very grateful for that. But getting my work out there and communicating with, with an audience is something that I do. And I do it now on all these different platforms. Um, and it's, it's, it's confusing sometimes, but um, I, I think, and I'm not the only one that's doing this. So many people are doing this now. We were talking about that earlier and I have a Patreon now. So um, trying to tap into the audiences in a, in a thoughtful manner that I have out there. I have a lot of people that say they like my work. And so I try to communicate with them. I try to, I try to answer all, all tweets coming at me um, that are asking a question or commenting positively on me or Instagram. Um, uh, Patreon is new to me, but I'm trying to, I have a few sponsors, so I'm trying to, um, to figure out how to, how to give back to them. And, um, yeah, so it's, I know I'm not the only one doing this, but it's, I think, uh, it's the wave of the future because I don't, I think the big media companies, everybody's kind of tired of having to work through a gatekeeper. <laughs> Well, the, the other thing that the other thing that strikes me about it, right, is it's advertising and and right right now, the way the money flows, say to you on a on a picture that's in that's in the New Yorker is, is somebody has to advertise, you know, coffee or water or whatever, and they get their piece and, and a piece of it goes, it goes to you where if you're directly getting paid by somebody on Patreon or hymns, and they, they give you a couple bucks, or they, they sponsor you for the year or something, mm -hmm. right, you've kind of taken this advertising piece. Um, out of the middle of the of the equation, which I think is mm -hmm. fascinating. The other thing is that the advertising model is built on broadcasting. It's built on really big numbers. And I think, you know, this whole kind of bifurcation that we see in the internet age where you have big, massive things like the Academy Awards, which is probably fading a little bit, where everybody participates, Super Bowl, that type of thing. And then you have, you have kind of hyper-specialization at the, at the complete 
opposite end. And it's that it's that ugly middle, which is a pretty dangerous place to be from a distribution point of view, but it allows you to have, you know, micro audiences of people that really, really like what you do, the way that you do it, who you mm -hmm. are, and, mm -hmm. and to have this direct connection. But um, has, it been, has it been rewarding? Are you getting, you know, you, I, I imagine there's got to be a ton of cartoons. You said you did eight to 10, eight to 10 a week uh, that never saw the light of day that suddenly now you've got you know, a yeah. vehicle to bring those things to life because maybe they were too edgy for the New Yorker or uh, right. they just didn't like them or maybe it was a bad day or maybe one of your competitors just had better, yeah. you know, for, for whatever reason, because now, now all this stuff comes out and gets to see the light of day. Yeah. I mean, I um, usually now do new stuff for my, for my uh, uh, audiences uh, on those platforms. I don't, right. sometimes I'll bring out an old cart, uh, you know, a rejected New Yorker cartoon. But um, it's very rewarding. It's it's you know I spent my early part of my career not not knowing if people like my work, and you just depend on the editor. If they like it, they'll buy it, and then they run it, and then that's that's it. Right. You, don't, you don't hear anything back. I mean, you have to be careful. I know a lot of people probably do pay attention to the the the, the metrics and the the feedback, and then draw accordingly. I try not to do that, although I'm sure it's influencing me what what people say and think and feel um, about what I'm drawing. So. Um, I, I'm not going to be naive and say it doesn't, but um, I don't. I try not to draw for the metrics. I try not to draw for uh, the trends. Although I try to draw what people are talking about. Right, right. So, so, so let's just shift gears about kind of where we are today. So you've obviously embraced technology in a major, major way. You do well. You can you can describe. I mean, you do live drawings every weekday that people can tune in and. I mean, obviously, this has been a very busy week, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> at the least. Um, so, so you know, it's it's a much more kind of visceral and direct experience with what you're doing mm -hmm. each and every day. And so, how has that worked out? How has it evolved? What's kind of your your thoughts having having uh, done that? You know, I think one thing that about the live drawing that I do with every day now, I think it's a it's a human connection that people are enjoying. That's I think one thing that that they like about the live drawing is that it's a uh, it's a connection with another human being about an issue or about feeling. Let's, um, yeah, uh, that, that was for that, COVID. That, this is a great the COVID one. was about women, women, I think it was about women and um, the, yeah, the we, burden we, that we, COVID we, was placing on women. So right. that's what, that was one of my daily live draws. Um, right. I, I love uh, it. It's me, again, super powerful, kind of light and whimsical in your style, but a very, very serious message without any, well, without any words. Yeah. You know, Jeff, if you, you know the old adage: if you whisper, people will lean in and listen. So right. my drawings, in some ways, are are whispering, and I think people appreciate. Some people, anyway, appreciate a a quieter um, take on on things. It's, I'm not trying to hit people over the head with my opinion. I'm just showing them something that I'm observing. That was done early on in the Trump administration when he was attacking the press. I've done. Right. I use the Statue of Liberty a lot. But you anyway, do. the the um the the live drawing thing. I'm so I'm really kind of excited about it, even though it's very difficult. When the pandemic hit and we all had to stay home, um, I was in my studio a lot more than I usually am because I love to travel and I'm invited to travel. So, and when I travel, I use my drawings to communicate with my audience by live drawing. Couldn't do that. So um, I'd done this before. I'd drawn on paper with my phone over my hand. And I've noticed, years ago, I noticed that that was of interest to people. They liked seeing people draw. They liked the hand, watch the hand create something. And so I started doing that in March. And um, I was not creating a particular uh, um, cartoon idea. It was more like I was just drawing what I was hearing on the news about the pandemic, about COVID. And I would draw the healthcare workers. I would draw the people that are delivering groceries. I would draw, you know, um, people in hospitals, families losing loved ones. I, you know, whatever was was on our minds, I would draw it and talk to the pe talk to my audience as I drew it. And people told me it was, it was um, that, first of all, calming. They found it calming to watch me draw. And um, they li I think they liked the connection with another human being. And then they, some of these people got to know each other on the, on the stream. You know? So there's a little community. This is Instagram right. I'm talking about. Right. And so now I have this regular group of people that show up every time I do it. I do it at five o'clock on Instagram. And um, it, had, it morphed from, the, from COVID uh, to Black Lives Matter and all, and all the, the sad, parts of that, you know, that George Floyd and Ahmed Aubrey and the people that were killed and um, uh, 
difficult subjects for me because I don't usually draw about race. So I, I should, but I, I haven't, um, but that taught me some things. And, um, and now the election and now uh, whatever the heck's going on right now. <laughs> so <laughs> sometimes I don't have an idea. Like yesterday I had no particular idea. I just wanted to draw Trump in handcuffs. So that's what I did. And I, I drew Trump in handcuffs. So I, it doesn't always rise to a specific idea, but I think people don't mind. They just like to see you draw and right. talk about what's going on. And people are, people, are, uh, people are so generous and very kind. So I do, sorry, let me just say that I do that at five every weekday on Instagram. Right. Okay. And then there's this new uh, startup. You, you mentioned it before, Haps TV. They approached me in March. Um, a young, a group of young men have created, and some of them are not young. Some of them came from regular, um, uh, what do they call it? Uh, this is a, t a term for the um, established media. I can't remember what it is. Um, <laughs> Probably not very complimentary these days. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not. It's not a bad word, but it's something. Uh, anyway, they some of them have been in in, in regular media, and um, they started this this thing called Haps TV, which is a um, a platform you can download it on your on your phone, and it's for live streaming. So they have, and they wanted me to want be one of their verified journalists, right? Um, and they have verified journalists all over the world that stream about things that are going on wherever they are. And uh, this was just as the pandemic was beginning. So I, I said yes, I'll, I'd love to because they they got it. I think they got what you've been talking about. What I've been trying to talk about is we don't necessarily need to have um, the CBSs and the New Yorkers. I mean, it's good to have those in your in your bio, which I I do. Uh, but it, uh, and I'm not putting that down. I'm just saying it's hard to move forward sometimes with these with these large large monolithic media, right? With a, with an innovative idea, right? Um, well, I was so, curious with uh, apps. Is it is it like Patreon? Is it I, I couldn't decide whether it was like Patreon or like Twitch. Or like, uh, or like Periscope. It, it seemed like a combination of the three. I don't actually, I don't know what Twitch is, believe it or not. That's so funny that I- So I Twitch, Twitch is the gamer live streaming oh. platform. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a whole genre of people watching other people playing games and it's community and uh, it's, hang, it's all the same stuff that you're talking about. It's just that the focus of the, of the attention at the moment is a game, but it allows mm -hmm. you to, to give money and, and do all I those see. types of things. Right. Then you have Periscope, which is about ready to die that the, the Twitter right. live streaming platform. Um, yeah. And then you've got, uh, as you said, Patreon, which you said you also have a Patreon account, which is the one I think of first when I think of just, again, kind of direct, direct financial support, uh, mm -hmm. to creators, whether it's on a per mm -hmm. unit or, you know, Jack mm -hmm. Conti's done some really interesting stuff there. So, um, well, good for you. And, and, yeah. and you Haps, have, uh, let me just say Haps is, Haps is a combination of Patreon and probably Twitch. So they have, uh, and uh, so when the announcement of Periscope came down that it was going to stop, a rush of, 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 of content providers went over to, to Haps, apparently. It was just like okay. this huge I, I heard about it from the, the, the guys who run Haps because they, they're in touch with, with creators. And um, so you can be my sponsor. You can give me five, ten dollars a month or more. Um, but you can also give me money as I with little awards. I think that's what Twitch is like. You know, they give me money per episode if they like right. a clapping award right. or a, right. give me a beer or give me a coffee or whatever. So and just yeah. just for other young creators out there, not not as as Liza the the long term professional published worker, but as as kind of a content creator, kind of navigating all these these channels and distributions and direct contacts. Is it is it overwhelming? Is it exciting? What would you what would you tell people when they're they're you know trying to figure out they've got a creative urge and not really sure how to get that distribution? Yeah, I actually talked to the daughter of a college friend of mine because she's wanting to become a chef and I turned her on to Haps because it. she just wants, she's got excitement. She wants to create content and, and uh, uh, wanted to do a book. And I'm like, well, books are a whole nother thing and they're really hard to get published now. Um, I, I turned it towards Haps just thinking that, because she does do, apparently does do online speaking. So um, it's exciting, but it is overwhelming, but, um, if you like, like becoming a cartoonist, if you really want to do it, you'll find a way to do it. Right, so, right. Um, and uh, you know, reach out to other people. I've been, re I reached out to a, a guy uh, 
who is a, a his day job is in the government, but he's a he's a he has a a, a travel um, Patreon page for um, New Orleans. I've never been to New Orleans. I don't know the man, but he's very successful on on Patreon. I know him now, and I just reached out to him like, can you tell me how to navigate Patreon? <laughs> um, so yeah, reach out to people. Um, hopefully, they'll be helpful. I get right. people coming to me all the time asking for assistance and and, and advice on things. Well, I was going to say the. Uh, you know, as we as we kind of come towards the end here, you shared some secrets with those Yukon grads, um, and and I wrote them down because I always like to grab secrets from from commencement <laughs> speeches. Always have an eraser. I like it. You might make. Did a I say that? You will make mistakes. And uh -huh. then your next line was mistakes are sometimes the best part of of the of the output, which I thought was was so powerful. And then you know, know a little about a lot of things, um, mm -hmm. which which clearly something that you do and 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 you touch on such a broad uh kind of slate of topics but um i just give you the the kind of final word uh, thankfully hopefully things will be a little bit less chaotic here uh in 14 days um you won't quite have the fodder of the orange uh that you've had yeah. in the last four years for never ending things to write about that's for sure yeah. um I wonder if you can just kind of share your thought as, as, as you look forward, you know, you're, you're managing all these social media platforms. You're, you're writing on tons of really important topics, which the good news is at least a lot of them seem to finally be having uh, some traction. Mm -hmm. At least it feels like we've turned some corners on a few of these topics, including the black, mm -hmm. black lives matter. Mm -hmm. um, as you look into 2021, <laughs> discounting the events of this week, um, what are you excited about? What are you, uh, mm -hmm. what are you looking forward to? Mm -hmm. Well, one thing I said also in that speech that you mentioned, um, which carries over into the new year and sort of trying to get us um, past where we've been for the past four years is I told the graduates to 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 listen. Um, that was my the thread that went through the talk because uh, that's what I have to do. I have to really listen to people. I watch too. I'm always watching people, but I'm listening. To what's going on I'm listening and I think if we listen to each other we'll we'll, we'll really listen it's, it's so easy to just say it but it's um and that's what I try to do with my cartoons I I yes I've been harsh on uh the president over the years but um I try not to be um unnecessarily mean because it, you it'll divide us even further you know, this this cartoon was uh, done recently about hope because I I'm I'm an optimistic person and I think if we embrace hope, um, um, it's just got to be it's going to be posit more positive. Yeah, I mean it's it's it, you can get caught up in the craziness of social media and um, and not listen, but you can also listen very carefully on social media. You can listen. I have a great group of people that I connect with uh, on every morning on Twitter. I say good morning, and it helps me get going. It also helps, I'm told, helps other people get going with their day in a positive manner. Right. Um, there's been some mornings in the past four years where I didn't have an exclamation point on my good morning, but I would say good morning nonetheless. <laughs> well, I actually but, uh, I have your quote from that from that commencement speech right here. And you said, you said, uh, learn through other people's experience, which I thought was so powerful. Laugh a lot, laugh at yourself, laugh with others, not at others. Uh, and listen deeply to yourself and others. You'll be surprised at what you'll hear and what you can do with what you hear. Mm -hmm. uh, very powerful messages for the uh, Thank you. For the graduates. Well, Liza, I'm, I'm so uh, so thankful you were able to take a few minutes out of your day to uh, to sit down. I, I wanted to talk to you at that WIDS event, but Lisa was doing all the interviews and that was the, that was the right thing to do. I was very jealous because I, I wanted to sit down with you. So thanks for, uh, oh. for taking time and hopefully yeah. you won't have quite the madness of fodder uh, for your for no, your, I hope uh, not. Cartoons. It'll be interesting to see how I how I and other cartoonists uh, handle the new the new administration. It's going to be a lot different. Yeah, but, well, um, Saturday Night Live can do it. You can do. I wanted to draw for you guys, but I don't really know what to draw. Let me think. Um, uh, shall I draw for you? I would love I would love for you to draw. Okay. What what do you, does something pop into your head? No. <laughs> no. No. So. He's gonna go for so while while you're uh, while you're drawing, um, talk a little bit about kind of how your techniques have changed over the years. Um, that's a good idea. I'm I'm gonna try to think as I show you. So I ever since I've started 
I don't know what you can see here. These are some of my pens and brushes. Pens. Yep. Ever since I began um, as a cartoonist, some light on the situation, light's not working. Um, I have used something called a crow quill pen, which is um, a dip pen, you know, like old fashioned and a bottle of ink. Uh, and um, this is what I started using when I was starting out. My first near her cartoon was drawn like this. Make sure you can see. What year uh, was your first New Yorker uh, uh, cartoon published? 1982. 82. They they bought they bought one in 1979 and then didn't run and they bought another one and then they didn't run it until 1982. <laughs> it was excruciating. <laughs> and if they buy it, you no longer have rights to it anymore, even if they don't run. I have it. some rights. I have we share the rights. Okay. And I started drawing. Um, for my mother, as you pointed out, but she gave me um, a copy of James Thurber's cartoons, a book of his cartoons. If any of your viewers, if any of viewers know that, know Thurber, you'll see the connection, the very loose, loose sort of simple shapes, very minimal. And um, so that's the tool that I use most of the time when I'm drawing on paper, when I'm not using a, dig a digital, stylus but this is a new pen that i've discovered is a pen it's a pen brush it's called a uh, pen tail pen brush and it gives you sort of the same feel a little more brushy and um uh let's see shall i finish with this maybe i will i so like what? drawing people who i like drawing people in motion right for some reason happy and you know moving and one of the interesting things you said in one of the TED Talks is, is and you're probably not doing it here, but the amount of kind of thought that goes into the process beyond mm -hmm. beyond the obvious. And you talked about having a backstory and 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 really kind of thinking through oh, yeah. the scene and being really like a cinematographer and, you know, what are they wearing yeah. and furniture and what is the background and, right. um, you know, really interesting as, as to the thoughtfulness and the intentfulness uh, of what goes on the page and what does not go on the page. Mm -hmm. Well, that's true for a New Yorker cartoon is you have to sort of pay attention to, uh, it's like I've said um, that being a, being a cartoonist is like, you're like a little, creating a little stage, a set of, with people, oh, see it's bleeding. I didn't wait long enough. The ink still was wet. Uh, but this is a this is the watercolor I use. Um, uh, so you know you're you're the set designer, you're the the choreographer, you're the uh, script writer, you're the casting director because you have to you know create this little scene of everything that's going on and the words if there are words in it. And then um, uh, it's a story. A single panel cartoon is a story. But it's also uh, got it's got a beginning and a middle and, uh, and an end. So the middle is the cartoon itself. So the people that you have in the in the cartoon, they have to make sense that they would be saying what they're saying, and the setting has to make sense. This is a great tool that uh, a Spanish cartoonist turned me on to. It's it's a pencil, but it's it's really thick and really fun. Um, what else can I show you? And and how and then and then when you're thinking it through, is it all in your head at the same time, and you're just putting it down, or do or does the picture come first, and then and then the words or the words? Well, come I also first? have a a book I can show you. Let me get quickly so it's just over here. I think the process is so fascinating. Um, each week, I try to um, when I come up with ideas you sit and you sit with a blank piece of paper or in this case, a blank sketchbook and uh, doodle. And sometimes I'll put down, I hope I don't show you anything that I don't want you to see, but uh, so this is, can you see that? Yeah, so these so these are kind of, of, of doodles. Of cons, of doodles uh, like, if you will. Mm -hmm. Doodles with words, construction site. I just, that popped in my head, I wrote it down. You never know, it might come in the cartoon It never turn into anything, but it's, it's a situation that might be helpful in some kind of situation. Here's, I just drew a, you know, a coffee machine and a blender over here and the blender saying, I love you no matter the distance. And that, that was a cartoon that I drew up and sent to the New Yorker, but they didn't buy it. Um, and that was a pandemic cartoon. Uh, you know, just doodles and, uh, and I'm trying to find, I'm trying to find that one you did 
when you say construction, I only got whistled that 18 times today. Oh, yeah. Not, not, God, uh, I couldn't find 42. that to give you. Um, <laughs> but that that was a more serious cartoon that, yes, uh, that, yes. about feminism. Um, you know, desert island drawing. So it's it's a lot of just sitting with words and images. And sometimes something will come. Like here's a woman picking some fruit from a stand, the, the, the piece of uh, uh, apple saying, why me? That didn't come into anything. That didn't become anything. But right. um, this is a woman walking up some steps. And over here, I see the word cave steps. And that actually turned into a cartoon. I drew it. Uh, it's not here, but I drew it into a cartoon of a... I, I do a, a lot of caveman drawings for The New Yorker. And, um, and a woman is saying, it's at the bottom of the stone steps go up to nowhere. And the there's a man at the top. And I forget what I had her saying to him. But they bought it and they took off my caption and they ran it in the back page of the caption contest. So you never know. Oh, they ran you it in the back page of the caption contest. Okay. Yeah, but, it, but in your own in your own mind, though, it, does it all happen together or uh, and and forgetting like maybe wordsmithing? But is is it the the picture that drives the the caption or the other way around or both? It both. It depends on. Sometimes you'll come up with a caption just sitting there and it'll go, oh, that's it. Sometimes you'll have to rewrite, reword the caption because it's the, the, the order of the words is important. Um, and, and talk a little bit about um, uh, Mother Liberty because you use the Statue of Liberty a lot. I do. It's a very yeah, powerful, there. very powerful that's person, it. metaphor, symbol. I mean, so yeah. many things going on there. Well, um, historically, the ones I like. use, huh? What? I was going to say one of your latest ones, you've got the uh, getting... Oh, yeah, there she is getting the COVID. Now, that one was done um, a couple of weeks ago during the live draw. Um, and it was because not only does the... Um, not only was there hope in there because they just got the vaccine, but there was hope because of the election, I think. Yeah, I think Biden had just won. So... Um, there's a mixed mixed message there, but she, you know, historically cartoonists have used um, Uncle Sam as the um, symbol for America. I'll just I'll just take the moment to draw. And here's Liberty. another another uh, another recent one. I think this is the one you're selling T-shirts and mugs. Oh and yeah, that's, I'm speaking my daughter. When I thank you, yeah, it's it's in the mail. Um, Kamala during her debate with Mike Pence, she's she's if you watched it, I'm sure you did. She kept, she said a couple of times, uh, Mr. Vice President, I'm speaking, I'm speaking. And she got that great look on her face. Um, and I, I was live drawing the debate. So I had other drawings of her and Pence, but that one I, I made put onto t-shirts and hats and, and mugs and people are buying them a lot. And they're still, they're still there. If you, anybody wants one, they can just go to my website. And, uh, and how long, how long have you, it kind of goes back to this kind of multi-channel multi-connect. How long have you been selling merchandise? This is new. Uh, I sell prints all the time for people, prints of drawings that they like, uh, that they see of mine. But um, this is my Statue of Liberty. She doesn't really look like that, of course, but she's... Um, yeah, so this is new. The, the merchandise is new. And uh, my daughter's helping me with the store because it's I don't know how to do spreadsheets and she does. So <laughs> she's right. really organized and I'm not. Um, actually, she, you don't see her physique at all and then last week i did um a drawing of her holding the capitol building i won't draw it here because uh this is my feeling about the statue of liberty she represents the best of america i think and um she represents what we're supposed to be uh and this is a beacon of, of hope to people to come here and join us in in democracy uh people from around the around the country and I last week I drew her holding the Capitol building uh, yeah, because it looked like right yeah do you, do you have that yeah because yeah, it because it would look like the uh, the Democrats were winning and um, in Georgia sorry I'll come back over. Oh, this was this was the fateful Tuesday before the fateful Wednesday because then you you also then live oh god from, uh, yeah uh -huh. for Wednesday's but events I, I as feel well. like the Democrats um, at least in the, since the last four years, the Democrats are, are a beacon of hope and they're more respectful to our democracy. Um, and that's why I did that Capitol building in, in, in replacing it with the, 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 the light that she holds. Yeah. So 
She's a great yeah, symbol. The foreshadowing for the next day. I mean, oh my goodness. <laughs> and I'm stuck today. I don't know what I'm going to draw. I really want to draw about the um, the racist nature and the white privilege of um, the. Uh, it's got to be something about that. It's got to be something with that picture from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. I mean, that's the one that everyone is using as the juxtaposition um, to Buffalo Head and the treatment that that, that they got. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Seems to be there's a lot of, a lot of juxtaposition of that photo floating around. Which photo? The, on the Capitol steps? It's the one from no. It's well, I'm not sure which one they're using of the of what happened Wednesday, but the one they're using from the Black Lives uh, event oh, uh, mm -hmm. protest. It was a really scary looking uh, group of, of military yeah. guys on the steps of I think it was the Lincoln Memorial. Yeah, it was a very very good photograph very effective photograph you know really tight yeah. on uh on this guy yeah. in the foreground and you know very ominous very but ominous. it's a comp it's a complicated situation to draw a simple cartoon about it's not it's 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 white privilege it's racism and how do you depict that that's my problem you're good Without. at it though. <laughs> it's so many layers of kind of the double entendre in into your you know, into, oh, your, into your work and that, and I know that's probably a big piece of really what makes people's work is to have, you know, kind of these second order, third order layers of, of impact and thoughtfulness and, and what's really happening beyond, mm -hmm. you know, just kind mm -hmm. of the surface level. Mm -hmm. It's helpful to sit back and, or step back and look. Often my political cartoons are more uh, poignant if, if they are, uh, if I've taken a day to think about it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Well, Liza, well, thank you. Good luck with your, uh, thank your you. writer's block or your uh, drawer's block for this afternoon. Yeah, right. sure, thank I'm you. I'm sure you'll come up with something great. It's thank really you. great to catch up. I I, uh, I look forward to running into you in, in the hallways of a convention or 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 something once we're once we're Yeah, left, definitely. Uh, Where are you based? Of our okay. coops. I'm in, uh, I'm in Palo Alto. I'm in California. Oh, okay. Right. Uh, well, when I get out to California again, I'll see you. Yes. Someday. Yes. Okay. Eliza, thanks again, Thank and uh, congratulations on all your success and and, and you. really enjoy your work. And I do enjoy my good morning uh, every morning that I get from you. I try to, I try oh, to be you. quick and get back to you before it's been like six hours. <laughs> sometimes I'm sometimes that's okay. I'm not forget. Doesn't matter. Thank all you. Right. Thanks so much for having me. Jeff. Thank you very really much pleasure. as well. Okay. All right, Eliza Donnelly, Jeffrey. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. bye.